Thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. I'm coming to you today from Salina, Utah. This has been a historic site twice in its history. In its beginnings, it was a Civilian Conservation Corps camp. The CCC was part of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, which was an idea to revitalize the U.S. economy by taking what was approximately one-fourth of all Americans who were unemployed and employing them by the government to build new U.S. infrastructure. They built roads, trails, national parks. Some of them were employed to do historical research. Some of them wrote books. But it was a very interesting program that lasted for a long time and employed a lot of people. A lot of these were remote locations, and so they had to build camps for those CCC workers to live in, and this was one of those locations. However, after the CCC ended and World War II was going on, we needed a place for German and Italian prisoners of war, and this CCC camp became Camp Salina, which was a POW camp which housed approximately 250 German and Italian prisoners of war. So the building you see behind me is a recreation. It's not original to the site. However, this is the location that the camp was at. This would not have been what a POW was typically kept in. The 250 plus German prisoners of war kept here at this camp were kept in tents. So these were essentially a little bit better than primitive camping conditions. Now things like this might have been the hospital or an administrative building for processing, but this is not where the barracks would be. The barracks were actually, the actual soldiers themselves were just kept in a tent system. And they were here for however long it needed to be. Now obviously when this was a CCC camp, it wasn't a prison camp with barbed wire and guard towers, but when this became a POW camp, those are prisoners of war, they're enemy combatants of an enemy nation. This became a prison camp. Barbed wire was installed and guard towers, much like the one you see behind me, were installed to make sure that none of these POWs attempted to escape. May 8th, 1945, Germany capitulates with total surrender, thus ending the war in Europe. This means that Germany missed its thousand year Reich goal by only 988 years. But what that does mean is that the POWs that were kept at this camp probably felt a sense of relief. They were going to survive the war. They were here in a POW camp in the United States, but they were alive. Now, bureaucracy still applies. It's going to take a while for them to get repatriated back to Germany, or maybe they'll become an American citizen. Who knows? But they were alive, being reasonably humanely treated in a POW camp right here in Salina, Utah. There was a soldier that was put on guard duty here, Clarence Bartucci, and he had been punished a number of times for other things and they realized, you know what, we're just gonna send you over to that POW camp to kind of get you out of the way because we're gonna put you in this nowheresville and you'll just be a guard and get you out of our hair. On July 8th, 1945, literally two months to the day after the end of the war in Europe, he went into town, had a couple beers and said to the waitress, something exciting is gonna to happen tonight. He came back to his duty, climbed the ladder on a guard tower much like this, relieved the guard on duty, took over service. At approximately midnight, he spun the M1917, pointed it at the tents with 250 sleeping German POWs, pulled the trigger, and unleashed all 250 rounds, breaking fire into the tents. Six German soldiers were immediately killed. Three more were mortally wounded and died later. 20 more were wounded above and beyond that, but survived their wounds. They later were repatriated back to Germany with no compensation for their wounds, just treated as normal POWs. It was said that the, ho the hospital here on the camp, that the blood flowed out the front door in an attempt to save the lives of the nine men that were mortally wounded. There was a debate after this shooting if whether Clarence Bartucci was actually insane or insane, and whether or not he was suitable for facing uh, court-martial. Uh, ultimately decided that he was not sane and he was institutionalized in a mental asylum for an undetermined amount of time. He ultimately died in December of 1969. When they asked him why he did it, his answer was quite simple. He said, I wanted to kill Germans, so I killed Germans. Really what happened was he was not assigned to combat duties and he was so jealous of his lack of opportunity to kill something that he hated so much that he used the opportunity here as a guard with a belt-fed 30 cal to make sure that some Germans didn't make it home alive. This is the Fort Douglas Cemetery, in which the grand majority of internments here are U.S. Army veterans and their family members. However, POWs who passed away at Fort Douglas, both in World War I and World War II, as well as the Salinas, Utah POW camp, are buried here too. Here we have the Italian section. Then we come to the German section from World War II, including the nine victims of Bartuki's spree shooting. On July 8, 1945, Walter Vogel, Otto Bross, Hans Meyer, Ernst Fuchs, 
Fritz Stockmann, Frederick Ritter, who actually died a couple days later from his wounds. He was the only one that survived for a couple days post the spree shooting. Jörg Liske, Adolf Paul, and Gottfried Gog. Now, these are not the only men from Germany that are buried here as POWs, but those were the victims of that July 8th spree shooting. This monument stands in the Fort Douglas U.S. Military Cemetery as a memorial built in 1933 to remember the German POWs that were lost while they were interred here at the POW camp during World War I. It was refurbished in 1988 by the German Air Force and the German War Graves Commission. It also now memorializes the lost German POWs of World War II as well. Uh, it's interesting to note when you see a cemetery like this predominantly filled with U.S. military veterans' graves, but you see POWs of Italy and Germany and Japan as well, but more importantly those nine men who died due to a spree shooting fueled by rage, that when someone beats the drums of hate, someone will come and answer the call. Guys, if you like this kind of interesting historical content, please consider supporting InRage on Patreon. It's your funding that allows me to come to places like this to bring you content like this. If you already are a supporter, thank you so much. If you're not, please consider it. If you can't do it, we understand. Please just subscribe to one of our multiple distribution points. You can find them all at inrange.tv and share with your friends. Thank you very much.